have to do with temptation. I just recently got a new credit card, and it's you know it's it's, it's in here somewhere. And there's this, the, the credit card. Uh, you, you guys probably already have experienced this. This thing, this is like, this is whoops, don't do that. This is an extremely condensed form of temptation, right? <laughs> because the payments are all in the future, and the stuff is all right there on the shelves of the store, so or, or even online. So the idea here is that temptation is going to make you want things now, and it's going to make it look like you don't care much about the future. The other thing is this ability to, to, to foresee the future and imagine it clearly. Okay? Um, modern psychologists have explored both of these things and continue to do so, and you've got two papers uh, on vSpace that go into this. So the first of these things, uh, the ability to imagine the future clearly, is now referred to as future time perspective. Okay? And there are two dimensions to this in the theory that is reviewed in this Simmons et al. paper. The cognitive dimension is how far in the future can you visualize what your life might be like? Can you put yourself there just cognitively? And then cognitively, how well do you recognize the impact of your current choices on future outcomes? So this is all, these are all cognitive processes, right? And then there's what's called a, dem- a dynamic dimension. I prefer to think of it as an affective or emotional dimension, which is how strongly do you actually feel the anticipated future impacts of current choices. I know this is going to hurt, but I don't care is somewhat different from, it didn't occur to me that that was going to hurt because I just wasn't able to put myself in the future with sufficient clarity. And then there's this whole topic in psychology of willpower and self-control. Right? How strongly do you experience temptation varies from one person to another, and then how much willpower do you have to overcome temptation? Um, now, to me, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is all highly complex, right? So you could, you could imagine all kinds of variation, not only from person to person, but from situation to situation. So what if you have long-range future time perspective, but you just have very little self-control, right? That's the, I know this is going to hurt, I care that it's going to hurt, and I just can't say no. Um, what if your ability to visualize the future drops off sharply after one week or after one semester or after one year, okay? So the way my mind works is this. I am extremely tempted by lots of things, and I have extremely strong willpower because I've spent the last 30 years of my life developing it, and I would not be standing in front of you or indeed anywhere on the planet if that wasn't true. My future time perspective is like from here to the end of the class. I, I genuinely, I have, it's a huge problem for me. I have very little ability to imagine what my life is going to be, week, going to be like in two weeks' time. And past two years, I quite literally, I can tell you this, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even exaggerating, I literally never think about what my life or the world around me is going to be like in two years' time. Um, <clears throat> people have told me I should save for retirement, and I have sufficient willpower to do so. Um, but it's not because of my future time perspective. So this stuff is complicated, right? This is complicated. My, my uh, willingness to, my tendency to exhibit present bias preference is influenced in different directions by these different types of psycho- these different aspects of psychology. Here's what happens in the DU model. Samuelson comes along, and he basically replaces all of that psychological complexity with a single parameter, delta. Okay? Just boils it all down to data, delta. Self-control is completely ignored. If delta is small enough to capture short-term temptation, it can't explain, explain long-term patience. So this model completely ignores impatience. Future time perspective theory is ridiculously simplified. It assumes that your ability to visualize and feel the future decreases smoothly starting now. It isn't true for me. For me, I have a very clear idea of what my life is going to be like for the next 45 minutes, quite a good idea of what it's going to be like from now until the end of Sunday. I can do a reasonably good job of figuring out next week, and then it plummets. Okay? And then it cruises along. I have some idea of the rest of the semester. I know it's going to be really hard. Next semester is fairly clear to me as well. And then after that, it literally goes to nothing. I don't have the faintest idea what I'm going to be doing next summer. And it doesn't occur to me very much how my current actions are going to impact next summer. Um, so, but in, in this model, that all just happens smoothly forever in a nice, smooth way. Samuelson himself. Now, this is, this is where I want you to just really... Well, I'll say this, and then I'll, and then I'll make my caveats. Samuelson himself in 37 knew that his model was ridiculous. This was a mathematical exercise, and if you read the paper, it's, it's, it's very, very clear that this was nothing but a mathematical exercise to Samuelson. From a positive perspective, he said the following. It is completely arbitrary to, to assume that the individual behaves so as to maximize an integral of the form envisaged. Remember, the utility function is this sum, right, of delta to the t times ut. So this is just the discrete time version of an integral. He did it in constant time, term, in constant time so that was an integral. He says it's arbitrary to assume that the individual behaves so as to maximize that utility function. Arbitrary is a fairly strong word. From a normative perspective, the ability to actually explain people's choices, I love this language. The idea that the model could have any influence upon ethical judgments of policy is one which deserves the impatience of modern economists. Let me tell you something. For something to deserve the impatience of modern economists, it has to be really ridiculous. Um, nonetheless, the discounted utility model has been used for positive and normative purposes for many decades. Right? So what is that? 70, 70 decades. Seven decades. Can you guess why? Because it's easy. Any other guesses? Because there's nothing better? Decision makers like it because decision makers are wealthy and this says that I shouldn't pay taxes to help you in your retirement. It could be that. Um, anything else? So we have easy, we have there's nothing better, and there's no preference reversals. So if I'm, an, if, I'm an, if I'm a neoclassical economist, what I know is that if I write down a model that does, that does not exhibit dynamic consistency, that, that, that allows for preference reversals, my head is going to explode in about 16 seconds, and, I'm not, and I'm gonna, it's going to be a disaster. So I'm going to make the one assumption, the one assumption about discounting, that will make the math super easy because any other model makes the math go crazy, that's going to maintain rationality of preferences. Um, and it turns out, weirdly enough, like a lot of microeconom- rational microeconomic models, it, it, it does in weird ways. It's arguable to say that in weird ways it does actually favor the ruling class, um, the wealthy. I'm going to emphasize the rationality point, because I think for, for my purposes in this class, that's what matters most. Okay, so uh, we have some psychology that suggests that people discount the future and inflate the value of the present. Here's, uh, here's how we can get that into our model, right? These, things are, these two theories, self-control theory and future time perspective theory, are saying the same thing. They're saying it in different ways. Self-control theory says people inflate present impacts relative to any future impacts, right? The present matters more because I can't really visualize... Uh, Sorry, self-control theory, which is about temptation, says that I inflate present impacts because they're tempting. Future time preference theory, uh, time perspective theory, says that people deflate all future impacts relative to any present impacts. These things are exactly the same thing. Psychologically, they're very different, but in terms of just this basic uh, uh, inflation and deflation, they're the same, right? Both theories predict a sudden drop-off in the discount factor beyond some point in time defined as the present, right? Future time perspective says I can visualize the present relatively well. After that, I'm in the dark. Temptation says that if something is present in front of me in this moment, I'm tempted by it. If you could push it into the future, it's not tempting anymore, okay? Either way, we say that people have present biased preferences. And here's what we do with that, okay? Now, I showed you last time a graph of the, uh, the exponential discount function, right, starting with 1, and it slopes off in this nice exponential curve, right? What we think is really going on in people's behavior, if I just mark out time periods like this, is that, sure enough, we're going we're to sort of normalize and say that d of, t, d of 0 is going to be equal to 1, and that, what we think seems to happen is that there's this sharp drop-off, 
between now and the immediate future, whatever the first time period out is, so that you have d of one there. And then after that, um, we're going we're gonna to sort of think that, yeah, beyond that, we're into the realm of sort of, um, now you're trading off the uh, different points of time in the future. So you're no longer involved, you're no longer experiencing temptation, let's say, and so this thing begins to slope off exponentially. Okay, that's, that's the idea, that's what this present bias idea would look like on a graph of a discount function. Good? Makes sense? Seems reasonable? Um, now, uh, it turns out that there's this extraordinarily simple way of capturing this basic insight um, that radically changes the model. Um, and apparently, I, well, it's fine. So you make one tiny change, which is that you, right, so you just have to mathematize this shape. And there's a very simple way to do it, which is called uh, quasi-hyperbolic discounting. So the discount factor d of t is a quasi-hyperbolic function of time. A hyperbola, right, would, would be something that has potentially a sharper bend. A quasi-hyperbola is something that approximates that by just sticking in a kink, okay? And, and the way you do that is you just say, look, um, whenever t is equal to zero, whenever, whenever, it's, whenever um, t is now, it's going to just be based on delta to the t, which is going to be one. And then for any future time period, t greater than zero, we're going to stick in this extra factor beta. And we're going to take the exponential discount factor, and we're just going to multiply it. We're going to stick in an extra discount factor, uh, beta. Both delta and beta are between 0 and 1. Beta can actually be 1. If you have delta of 1, things go crazy. Beta can actually be anywhere. Uh, uh, it can't be 0. That would be insane. That would mean that you completely ignore the future, which might be true if you're really drunk. Um, but, it, but beta can actually be exactly 1 in this model. So the discounted utility of a plan P stretching out from period 0 on out becomes, um, and here I'm making a little simplification. I'm gonna, from now on, I can't remember if I mentioned this last time. Instead of writing u of x naught, I'm just going to say u naught, the utility that you get in period 0. And so what we have is we have an, an undiscounted immediate payoff. Right? That's the same. The, payoff, the pay payoffs in the present are never discounted in any model. And then in the future, we're going to take this sum. This is the Samuelson discounted utility sum. And we're just going to discount all of it by an additional beta. Right? So I can take this. So this beta is going to show up in every discount factor in the future. So I can just pull it out of the sum. And um, here's what's going on. You can think of this either as deflating the entire future by beta less than 1, which psych psychologically captures future time preference theory. Or you could say, well, that's the same as taking the utility and multiplying it by 1 over beta, and then multiply everything else by 1 over beta. And you're going to get 1 over beta times u0. And then beta times 1 over beta is going to go away. And then you're going to have the Samuelson sum. Okay? Now, we know that utility is invariant to scale shifts. right? So you can multiply that, not scale shifts, but to, scale, to scaling up. So I can multiply your number of utils by 1 over beta, and your preference ranking is going to stay the same. So in terms of representing preferences, I can just get rid of that and say that this little math here, where I've inflated the present by 1 over beta, is exactly the same. It represents exactly the same preference as this one, where I deflate the future. It doesn't matter whether I think of this as inflating the present or deflating the future, it catches the same basic concept, which is that your preferences are biased towards the, towards the present. Now, all the math we're going to do uses this version. Nobody ever does this. Okay? And everything else about the DU model remains the same. That one little change, slipping in that beta parameter, is just going to, it's going to make amazing differences to the way this model performs. Okay. Let me give you an example. So this is just a stylized little example. Uh, sorry. Um, I meant to just do one thing in case it's not obvious. So this, this summation, right? So what this, what this becomes, right, is it becomes u naught undiscounted plus beta times delta times u1 plus beta times delta squared times u2 plus beta times delta cubed, right, et cetera. And so what's happening is that the per period discount factor is, is changing over time. Okay? All right. Now let's go back to this. That's the table we started uh, with, and I have, um, I have uh, added a couple of rows because I want to do some math just to give you a sense. And this is, this is where we started right back in 1981, um, moving towards this, this what's called the beta delta model. So I'm going to do this. Um, I... Uh, if, if, so I have this model that says if I'm indifferent between 250 now and xt in t periods, that means that 250 is equal to the discounted value out in the future, which in this case is not delta to the t times that xt that you said was your indifference point, but beta times delta to the t. Okay? Um, what that implies, right, so now I can um, solve that for and say xt is going to, sorry, I can solve that for beta and say that beta is going to be equal to 250 divided by delta to the t times xt. Now my experimental subjects are supplying me with xt, so in order to get an estimate of beta from this experimental data, all I need is some kind of estimate of delta. Right? So if I have an estimate of delta, I can plug it in right there, and I can get an estimate of beta. Where would you go if you wanted to get the most likely estimate of the long-term uh, time discounting factor, delta, in this model? Where would you look for evidence of people's willingness to trade off nine years from now against 10 years from now? Long-term patients. Sorry? The one-year one, the one in the middle, the 0.96? So basically, this is what, what one year is doing is it's giving me one month where there's no beta, right? One month, of, it's defining the present as the first month. So I'm going to have a really shocking drop in my discount factor then. And then 12, 11 more months. The 10-year gives me that first month of present bias, followed by 119 months of basically just my discount factor going down steadily by delta per month, OK? So where I want to go is I want to say, look, that's going to be my best guess as to what delta is. So I'm going to stick that in here. Okay? X1 is 300. So now I'm going to go to the place where I think beta is going to have the biggest bite. I'm going to go to the, to the one month, the real short term. And what I get is this. X1, which equals 300. Right? X1 equals 300 implies that beta equals 250 over 0.99. That was delta um, raised to the first power because it's just one month out times 300. Uh, sorry, 250, which is approximately equal to 0.84. Okay? So by this math, what I get is an estimate that people discount absolutely everything in the future by a factor of 84% relative to anything that's now. And then starting from one month in the future, they additionally discount you know, the second month right, by an additional 1% and the third month by another 1%, which is to say their trade-off, their willingness to trade off next month against the month after reflects quite a lot of patience. But their willingness to trade off now against next month is like super low. Okay? So let's, let's just stick that in here. Now, if that's the case, if I have this beta term stuck into the discounting function and it's roughly 0.84, what happens to my prediction? What does the model predict about x12? <clears throat> right? It predicts that x12 would be 250 divided by 0.84 times 0.99 to the 12. Right? Before, it was just 250 divided by 0.99 to the 12, which was shocking and ridiculous. By sticking in that 0.84, things, get, uh, things look uh, very different. And what I get is uh, $335. Okay. 
not so far off, okay, from the 400 that Thaler saw. What about x120, 10 years out? Then you get 250 divided by 0.84 times 0.99 to the 120, okay, and what you get is $994. Really not bad, okay. Now let me just let me just make sure. Did everyone follow that math? Yeah. Why? Because what I was saying is that the, the, I went as far out in time as I could. So this is a model that suggests that you're very impatient for the first month, and then you're gradually exponentially impa uh, more patient in the future. So I just went to the place where your estimate is going to be driven most heavily by delta. And you know, delta's probably higher than that, but I plugged that in. And the model suddenly does pretty well. Okay. Now let me uh, let me just clarify um, something about what we just did. I did not just show you that under the assumption that people discount the future relative to the present by a factor of 0.84, Thaler's data suddenly fits the model. What I just showed you is that if I um, write down an abstract model where the discount factor is uh, beta times delta to the t instead of just delta to the t, and, th then, <clears throat> and then let Thaler's data tell me what the parameters of this model should be, right? I just estimated beta, beta, uh, delta and beta using nothing other than the data from Thaler's experiment. And the numbers that I got for beta and delta suddenly make the data fit the model. Okay? So I came up with an abstract model that all by itself, without me imposing any other assumptions about what these numbers should actually be, fits the data remarkably well. Yeah? And what we're going to see for the next couple of weeks is we're going to see a whole lot of evidence from the real world in which this model, the beta delta model, is, uh, gives vastly superior predictions and explains observed phenomena far better than the original uh, uh, exponential model. I'll see you next Tuesday.